First of all, I've got to put this up. I don't expect you to read it. Uh, but I know there are some lawyers in the room here, and basically what it says, you're not to believe a word I'm going to tell you. Anyway, I want to talk uh, about our experience in South Africa. And this is our current acreage position on the east coast of South Africa. Um, unless you work in Africa, very, pe very few people actually realize how big it is. Our acreage covers the equivalent of 382 North Sea blocks. It's 76,000 square kilometers. And as you can see, we cover quite a large portion of the east coast of South Africa. Now, you'll see on here, we have what we call an exploration permit. And the others are called TCPs. These are called technical cooperation permits. And I'll explain these in more detail as I go through the presentation. But in this area, at West Breedersdorp and up at the Tugela Inshore TCP, we've actually applied for exploration licenses there. Moving on to how this got started, and, and really what I'm going to tell you about is really the history of impact. We're a very small new company. Uh, which was set up in 2009. And we were set up really because we saw an opportunity in South Africa. At the time, um, back in 2009, the Petroleum Agency in South Africa announced the fourth offshore licensing round. And the two areas they put up for licensing was one on the west coast over here and one in the east coast around the Durban area. We looked at the, the potential of the area and we got very interested in what was happening here. Oh, make sure I point in the... Not moving. There we go. The first thing we looked at was a Google Earth map. And what we saw was a huge pile of sediment offshore Durban. And contrary to what Neil said, that all the rivers do not flow out on the west side. There are a few rivers that flow on the east side as well. I know the Orange River Basin is huge, but also this area, which is fed by the Tugela River, we believe has been a, uh, an active river system over eons of geological time, and has actually built up a big pile of sediment here off the coast. We then noticed, even on Google Earth, what we thought were possibly pockmarks, and I'll come and talk about those a little bit later. And also, <coughs> we looked at the four wells which had been drilled in this area. These wells had been drilled up on the shelf. Uh, three of them were very old wells drilled in the 70s by uh, Sukor. One well was actually drilled by Phillips in 2000, and that well had oil shows in it. We then got hold of a seep map from Fugro, and this map showed 50 active oil seeps in the area. One of them is actually what they call an 80% confidence oil seep. You can actually see it on the surface. So it actually um, proved to us that there seemed to be an active uh, petroleum system working in the area. We also uh, got hold of some old seismic data, which was uh, reprocessed in the Far East by one of our directors, some of you may know him, Charles Ramsey. And uh, he actually reprocessed all of this data and put it up to the industry for sale. Nobody bought it. We bought it, and uh, the reason we, uh, we, we, we liked it was we started looking again at the seismic. We could see these pop marks on the seismic, which are indications, only indications, of possible leaking hydrocarbon. We started to see these chemotropic mounds, and I don't know if you're familiar with these things, but generally they're a buildup of algae on the seabed, uh, when the algae feed off leaking hydrocarbons. And we also saw indications of gas chimneys on the seismic. So we had seen enough just from the evidence that there seemed to be a mature hydrocarbon system working in this area. If we carry on and start looking in depth at the seismic, and I'm now looking here at the seismic lines that extend well off the coast, not the inshore seismic, we start to see these build-up of um, possible fan systems. We call this one dolphin because it's actually become more mature in later uh, seismic, so uh, we'll look at that later. 
Steve Eilert, who's here today, he carried out an exploration on, on the, the old reprocessed data. And we looked at other features. And one of the striking things about Dolphin at the time was that we got hold of an old Cosmos paper um, about the Jubilee field. And it immediately struck us that the morphology of, of uh, Dolphin was very similar to, uh, to Jubilee on that old, um, even on this old seismic data. We also saw other mounted sequence, probably basin floor fans at the end of the, at the, at the bottom of the slope. This thing's not reacting very well. <laughs> and we also saw some structural closure areas. <coughs> We saw areas that had a combination of structural and stratigraphic traps. And we saw these mounds, which really intrigued us, because at the time, we really didn't know what they were, but uh, they looked very interesting. And again, we'll come back and talk about those a little bit later. And we saw some pinchards on the slopes. Again, you know, very interesting from a hydrocarbon um, trapping point of view. We also looked at the economic and commercial terms in South Africa. And one of the things that uh, surprised us, actually, is that South Africa turns out to have one of the best fiscal systems in the world. If you look at this slide, they're right up on the left here. There are a couple of countries that are slightly better, but not many. Um, Falkland Islands is not quite as good. The UK comes in here somewhere, and Libya is down here somewhere. So it had a very, very attractive fiscal system. And that is reflected, I think, by the fact that South Africa has very little production and is very keen to get oil companies in to try and um, start um, production. At the moment, the country imports, I think Paul said, about 400,000 barrels a day of oil. So there's a crying need for uh, energy supply in the country. Anyway, we were awarded blocks here, four blocks, offshore Durban, and Shell were awarded their blocks on the West Coast. But if you see from this map, there's actually not much else that's been awarded. And this was back in 2009. And bear in mind that this was late 2009. Windjammer in Mozambique was discovered, or the announcement was made in February 2010. And that really changed the whole interest in Southern Africa. So we were just lucky enough to be in before the rush, if you like. Anyway, working in South Africa has its uh, interesting uh, quirks, if you like, as many countries do. And this is the way the um, exploration permits work. I said earlier that we had some TCPs. Actually, in the Tugela area, we went in and applied straight for an exploration license. Most companies go in first and apply for a TCP. But it was a competitive round, and we felt we needed to make sure we got this block. We bid 5,000 kilometers of 2D seismic data, and we went straight for an exploration permit. The other permits we have, as I said earlier, are TCPs. And when you get a TCP in South Africa, it's, it's really a desktop study for a year. And then you have the exclusive right to apply for exploration license. So you basically tie up the area, and you can then move on to the exploration permit if you wish to do so. But in between these stages, you have to carry out an EMP. And this can be a quite an involved process in South Africa. And it's done before you're awarded a permit. In many other countries, uh, you do that after the permit has been awarded, but before your work starts. In South Africa, it's a little bit different. And these things can actually take quite a lot of time. If you, I won't go into this slide in detail, but if you look here, this is 120 days to prepare, another 120 days for the petroleum agency to uh, consult with the other government agencies, so you're looking at possibly a year's delay before you actually get the exploration uh, license or the, T uh, well, sorry, not the TCP, the exploration license award. Out of this uh, EMP, we ended up with environmental restrictions. And the reason was that offshore Durban, there's a large colony of turtles that live on the beaches north of Durban. We weren't allowed to shoot seismic until the turtles had migrated away from the beaches north of Durban. And then we had to stop here when the uh, whales started coming up the coast. So we ended up with a four month window in which to shoot seismic. And I would have to say that we, like 
every, com every company who is serious about the oil industry pays a lot of attention to the environment. Although we're a very small company, we have an environmentalist on our staff, Nicole here, who's South African and lives in Guildford, and she works in our walking office. But we did a lot of study on the environment, and I think you know we all have to do that in our industry and make sure we take care, take care of it properly. Eventually, we got going. Our license was awarded on the 5th of May, 2011, and we immediately contracted the Seabird vessel, which is working in Tanzania, to come down and start shooting our 5,000 kilometer seismic. The vessel did have some problems with pirates on the way, but eventually it arrived on the 25th, and we started shooting. However, 25th of May, you're well into the South African winter, and although we had planned to get most of our 5,000 kilometers, we ended up getting only about 1,900 kilometers of data that period. The results, however, were very encouraging. I talked about dolphin area. This is earlier. This is dolphin now in much more detail here. And we see a, a very uh, convincing pinch out feature here. Um, over the tiger prospect, which we'd mapped from the old seismic, that was confirmed. But on the flanks of it, we saw quite a, quite a striking AVO anomaly. And in, in this is in a strike sense. In a dip sense, this is a pinch out wedge. So this is also a very strong indication that there are hydrocarbons here. We also saw another feature, called, which we call tiger two, which is another rollover feature further out in the basin. But most tantalizing and most amazing, as we went further north in our acreage, we started to see these uh, mid-slope turbidites. This is the edge of one of these major turbidites. The sort of <coughs> noise you see over this we don't think is real. Uh, when we were shooting this area, we moved well into the winter period, and the, the weather got quite noisy. And we'll look at this in the later seismic program later on. But this feature really intrigued us. And we went five kilometers away, and here it is. This is about 30 kilometers long. And RPS have mapped this, but 800 square kilometers of closure. It's a giant, giant turbidite sequence that uh, has never been seen before in the area. Um, we've called it Leviathan. I know there is another Leviathan in the Eastern Mediterranean. But at least we've got some whales around our area. This is a strike line across the toe end of that turbidite sequence. And this is, again, from the uh, earlier seismic data in 2011. And you see these, these mounds just extend and extend. And they actually go, go off the end here. So we were very encouraged by the first program. And we planned to come back in, in last year and again in the environmental window and complete the program. So this, this was our program for last year. It was really filling out the remaining part of the 5,000 kilometers. So we, we uh, got underway, and I'd just like to show you this little video of what happened. Gary, there you go. This is the ship actually shooting down the coast. And then she comes back up, and she's struggling a little bit as she goes back up the coast. It doesn't go on for too long, don't worry. <laughs> And this, she comes down again, and back up again, struggling again, and down again. And now she turns in to actually shoot the dip line. Just pause it there, pause it there. And you can see the problem. We had up to 60 degrees feathering on the cable. And at that point, we thought, oh dear, what are we going to do? Uh, we can't process data with 60 degree feathering, so uh, we really have a problem. Anyway, this is what was caused the problem. It's the Agulis current, and it's an amazing current that flows down the east coast of, of, of uh, Africa and, and South Africa. At the time when we were shooting last year, there was also a huge storm in the Mozambique Channel. In fact, all the work in Mozambique was shut down at the time. And that added probably two to three knots to this current, which was already flowing at probably three to four knots. So obviously, we had a huge, huge problem with it. 
So the only solution we could come up with was to reorientate the survey <laughs> to shoot at 45 degrees roughly to the current direction. And because we're dealing with a fan system, there's no real true dip and strike. We were really comfortable with, with doing that. Um, and from that point on, well, we shot uh, all of the survey in roughly a month, and we got some very good production. So the new data showed up some very, very interesting features. We now see a very classic hydrocarbon system where well, we have the pin rift sequence here, the sin rift, and then we have a post rift sequence. And Paul was talking earlier, Paul Carey was talking earlier about uh, you know source in this area. We see one of the main source areas being sitting in this sin rift, uh, probably Jurassic sequence. Um, Kimmeridge uh, shales in here has been a main source, but the source could extend right up, right up through to the Albion Actium uh, sequences. And again, I'll talk a little bit about source further on. But up above this, we see these major turbidite sequences. So we have the classic uh, system of hopefully a good source rock and a mature source rock feeding in to turbidite sitting on the slope here. And we don't know what this thing is cutting across it. But, and we also see some interesting features in the tertiary. And it's actually quite interesting um, when we review this and, and look back at a presentation that PASA had made back in 2003. This is by David van der Spey, who's now the head of the Petroleum Agency. Now, this is plotted in the opposite direction. But what they had predicted then from very poor seismic is what we really confirmed with the new seismic, that we are sitting on a classic petroleum system. The previous wells that were drilled up on the shelf were all drilled on little bumps here, uh, which had virtually, they had virtually no sand. But one of them, uh, the Phillips well, actually um, from, the, from the cuttings they recovered oil, which was actually tied back to a Jurassic source rock, a light oil. So that's the thing that gave us encouragement at the beginning. And now we see where these wells and we see these <coughs> big turbidites further down the system. So um, we are, we're very encouraged by all of this. And uh, I'd just like to compliment the Petroleum Agency on how well they got this, uh, how accurate they got this way back in 2003. <coughs> This is it again in more detail, but as we go through our area, we see a number of these mounds, and frankly, they're all over the place in the northern part of the of the uh, of the uh, Tegela Fan area. This is another one. Here's a more. And the other interesting thing that we notice is that above these uh, turbidites, there's a very quiet area. When I pointed out on the other seismic, we had noise here. On the new seismic, we have no noise. We use a geostreamer system now. The streamer was towed at 25 meters. And with the technology that PGS have, they can still preserve a good bandwidth uh, while towing the streamer deep. So we see this as a very, very good shale uh, package that should be, provide good, good seal for these uh, turbulence. Again, now this is uh, another part of the Leviathan feature, and this line is orthogonal to uh, the lines I showed you before, so it just confirms this huge feature. Again, it's around about 30 kilometers across. Um, we do see here remnants of the seabed multiple, which we haven't really been able to get rid of, but uh, that's because you, know, you get feathering on the cable, and these multiples are not entirely predictable because of the angle of the cable. Uh, so it's something we'd have to live with, but uh, nevertheless, we've got some very, very good quality data. This uh, slide is more or less the same as that low frequency slide I showed you before from the 2011 survey. Now we see these mounds in, in, in more detail, and, and they go on and on. And they present to us, you know, multiple reservoir targets in, in our area. In one of these areas, we also see possibly uh, a flat spot cutting across one of the mounds. It's too early days to really be uh, you know, definite about that, but there's certainly uh, indications of possible hydrocarbons here. What I've been talking about earlier is really all up here. Um, as we were doing all this, the rush to South Africa had begun, and lots of other companies had begun to move in. 
And we started thinking, well, we, we better not just stick with this area and be left behind. So we had commissioned uh, GTEC to do a major uh, paleo reconstruction study for us, uh, which uh, they did uh, very, very well and very competently. And uh, so we started to say, well, where can we look at in other parts <coughs> of the East Coast that, that could be prospective? And this area really caught our eye. We had actually applied for all of this, but another company came in here, so we didn't get quite all of what we applied for. But we got most of the 46,000 square kilometers. And the reason this area is so interesting is if you go back and several presentations here have talked about the reconstruction of, uh, of, 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 of the Atlantic and, and, and the, the paleogeography, not many companies have actually, sorry, have actually studied what happens down here and how this splits apart. A lot of work has been done up on these margins here, and Neil has been talking about this earlier, and, 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 and so you know this is probably better understood. But really, uh, nothing had really been done in these areas. And we, we uh, got GTEC to concentrate particularly on, on the southern area. And uh, the work they did was, was very valuable. Um, but just looking at this, the two major transforms, I mean, there are transforms all along the, 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 the Atlantic, but the two major ones are down here and up here. Jubilee, obviously, is a big success in Ghana, and uh, Teller stepped out into French Guiana and found ZDS, which is obviously uh, uh, you know, a major technical success for them. But we believe the same uh, situation could happen here. The sea lion discovery in uh, the Balkans has obviously been very interesting to us. But also the other drilling that's taken place by Borders and Sudden and by uh, Falkland Oil and Gas, where they didn't find commercial reservoirs, but they found condensate and they found gas. So they've proved up a hydrocarbon system over here without any doubt. So what's happening on the Transkai coast? Well, going on to one of the uh, diagrams from the GTEC report, it's very interesting because the Falkland Island platform really sits under in the sort of uh, early Cretaceous, late Jurassic period, it sits under South Africa. And these wells that were drilled, the DSDP wells, <coughs> were drilled on the Falklands uh, platform, actually, if you put them back in the correct paleo setting, are <coughs> offshore the, uh, uh, the Transkai coast of, of, of Africa. And the wells <coughs> had TOCs of up to 6% in the late Jurassic. They had up to 200 meters of rich organic shales. So essentially to us, they seem to again prove up the existence of a good source rock in this area. And also, you know, outside of this Orange River system, there are other rivers coming the other way. And we could see, you know, a real play that was interesting to follow up on, on this coastline. And then we got hold of some seismic. And this is a reprocessed line uh, that is uh, a dip line out from the coast. And this was reprocessed by Fugaro. It's a 1976 vintage line, I think it is. But it shows this big sand turbidite feature here. Um, and below it, we see you know, possibly tilted fault blocks. Uh, so it, it, it all seems to match you know, the, the classic sort of transform margin model, similar to Jubilee. When you look at that line, in detail, and we got hold of the CDP gathers. This uh, deep water terabyte or deep water fan system appears to show really strong amplitudes on the outer traces in the CDP gathers. And if you look all along this line, this is repeated several times as you analyze this line. Now, this is very early days and this is very old data, but it, we, we feel very, very encouraged by this area at the moment. Again, this is another line uh, along the coastline. And this is very, very similar to the Mahogany or Jubilee field in Ghana, which is there. This is from an Anadarko presentation. So very, very similar uh, characteristics. Um, so we feel this area is extremely prospective. If we move the clock forward, and these are our, our, our dreams, that uh, all along this coastline, there's been Terpeditic deposition all along the coastline from a river system that has existed here over long periods of, of, of geological time. So we're looking forward to uh, exploring this area. There's virtually no seismic here. It's, it's almost virgin 
exploration acreage. The final area I'm going to talk about today is the West Breedasdorf area, which is west of the Petrosay producing fields. And Neil mentioned something about the, these Petrosay fields in his talk. But uh, PASA produced a brochure in this area, and, and we quite liked it. And uh, we couldn't, again, understand why the industry didn't seem <coughs> to um, pay much attention to it. So we applied for this area. And our view of this is that this basin, which contains the Petros Asian, extends well into the area. Now, the common thinking in South Africa at the time seemed to be that this area was a little bit too far away from the source rock to have any hydrocarbons. And they had drilled a couple of wells here. When we analyzed where those wells were drilled, and we analyzed some of the seismic, first of all, from the seismic, we could see strong evidence of hydrocarbons. So we didn't really believe this idea that we were too far away from the source. But also where you saw the wells, the wells were again drilled on relatively poor quality seismic. And we have, in the last uh, six or eight months, been reprocessing quite a bit of data from this area. And we plan to shoot more data. These features are actually quite subtle. They're quite hard to see uh, unless you have good quality seismic. So we think this area has a lot of potential, but nothing like the huge potential that the Transkei area and the Tagera area has. These fields are of the order of 40, 50, 60 billion baal. But we expect we could find more of those, excuse me, in this area. Um, but there, the economics would be completely different. This is a relatively shallow water area, close to infrastructure. So smaller fields could, could well work in this area. And to the south of this area, there's a gravity low. This low has never been explored. There's not one kilometer of seismic that we know of across it. So again, there's an area here that we need to look at in more detail. Moving on, um, we were lucky enough to be able to announce at the end of last year, just before Christmas, a major joint venture with ExxonMobil. They approached us, and we eventually negotiated with them. And they have actually farmed in to 75% of all our acreage and will become operator, subject, of course, to South African government approval, which will occur on a step-by-step -step basis as we convert each of the licenses. Uh, into a joint venture with ExxonMobil. So we're very excited about that moving forward. It's a slow reaction time here. And what we're planning over the next uh, two or three years, first of all, we're going ahead with high-resolution airborne gravity radiometry over all areas as soon as possible. That will be followed up by multi-beam bathymetry and piston coring uh, surveys in all areas. Again, as soon as we can get, get on the way with that. And then follow up with 2D and 3D seismic. So we're going through a full, full exploration, you know, beginning to end exploration uh, package in, in all of these areas. And of course, the ultimate goal is to end up drilling here. And, and we predict that, uh, you know, once all of this work has been done, there's sufficient encouragement already, but we would see multiple wells being drilled on this acreage <coughs> as we move to the future. And looking at South Africa as a whole, uh, Neil again talked about wells in South Africa. Uh, I just did a, a, a very quick summary of, of what we see happening here. Um, Cairn have farmed in up just south of Namibia. BHP are there, Shell are here, Anadarko farmed into Petro SA. ExxonMobil farmed into our acres. Total are here. CNR are farming out for well commitment. Petrosay have these wells here. And Sasol are very active up here. So all in all, outside of the Petrosay acres, which are more development than exploration, we see probably 10 to 15 major exploration wells being drilled offshore South Africa over the next few years. It's very unlikely, in my view, that all of those wells will be unsuccessful. So. I think you know South Africa will be moving into an area where, uh, hopefully, in the not too distant future, it could become self-sufficient in, in oil and gas production. Finally, I'd like to say I've worked in many parts of the world that are not very pleasant to actually visit, uh, although they may be uh, very, very uh, good from an exploration point of view. South Africa, I'd have to say, scores very highly on both counts, and is a very, very pleasant country to visit. There's also some very pleasant places to go to. 
I think this is our last visit, and it's at the uh, Route Constantia Vineyard just outside Cape Town, and I would recommend it highly. <laughs> Finally, we obviously keep our fingers crossed for the future. Uh, I'd like to thank ExxonMobil for supporting this presentation, and I'd like to thank you all. Thank you. Any any questions, please? Yeah. Bob. You showed the um, movements of the currents down yeah. the down the coastline, which obviously affected the collection of the seismic. Just a speculative thought. I wonder if in the ancient past there could have been some equivalent currents, which could have been moving source material from the river estuaries down the coast of South Africa and sort of spreading the source rock. I was particularly interested when you mentioned the um, Fugro uh, seabed um, seep um, information because there clearly does seem to be source material along that, <coughs> along that edge. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, those Fugro seeps are very focused over the Together Cone. Um, in fact, if you look north and south until you get down to Mosel Bay, you don't really see those seeps. As regards the current, um, it's very hard to tell how long the, the, the uh, Goulas current has existed in geological time. But I think it's, it's obviously been there for a real amount of time. We don't see it as having had a huge effect in displacing the sediments that were just uh, uh, deposited offshore. They haven't been affected and swept <coughs> away. Um, so it's d I, I, I don't have a, a definite answer, but I don't think they've existed for you know, back into the Cretaceous period when these turbidites were, yeah. were being deposited. And how, how, how much length did Fugro look at to identify the presence of seeps? You said that they were kind of localised. Um, yeah, but they look over a long period of time. I mean, basically, you try to differentiate what, what could be shipping leakage or dumping or anything like that from natural oil seeps. And the only way they can do that is actually look at them over a long period of time and effectively the seals, that's, uh, the seeps that stay in situ over a long period of time, they give highest confidence to. But it's a, the, the minimum is four, yeah. four inches. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I just yeah. 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 Um, merge between the paleogeographies uh, that we've done at stage level for the Cretaceous with our climate <coughs> models and with tidal models that have been constructed in Imperial and we're looking at exactly that issue. So, what's this space? Okay. Can I just say that was already? No. Yeah, yeah, um, I was just going to say something that's relevant to um, what we were saying earlier. When we first were contacted by Exxon, um, Jeff, their geologist, said, I've been trying to get Exxon to do this for four years, this area. So you were talking about the sheep mentality. We can move. They couldn't because they had to do the internal sales first. So that's why. Yes, excellent. Are, are they, just as this is a question that's leading somewhere else, but are they giving you a full carry on this or are you funding? Terms are confidential. <laughs> 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 I just have to say we're not going to be raising money soon. Okay, because <laughs> that was my question, it was whether as a small company you're finding raising money difficult, but the answer is no, no. because you're not having to. No. Okay. I mean, uh, to be honest, um, we took the attitude as a small company, uh, and it's, it's, uh, every small company is faced with these decisions. Uh, we're a private company. Do we try to raise money privately, or do we go public to try to raise money, or do we try to raise money from the industry? And frankly, what we found in this area, the industry was far more interested than the investors were, uh, I think, you know, it's a little bit too early for investors. So we found we would get a, a much better deal to farm out than try to raise money and go further ourselves. Yeah, 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 good. Okay, thank you, Mike. Thanks okay. for that.